okay good morning everyone so uh this is our this is we should consider this is the last session of this series uh and we are very fortunate that today dr roop gurcharani is joining uh this session uh as a moderator and uh, speaker is puneet so we know both speaker as well as moderator puneet is a uh, md palliative medicine first md palliative medicine student from uh, aims new delhi and now is a senior consultant at gangaram hospital and uh, i think everyone knows dr roop uh, he is a urologist uh, at hinduja hospital but uh, uh, he is working very hard all over india as well as on the in the world map to integrate palliative care in uh, neurology a patient with who are suffering with end stage neurological disorders uh, he is board of directors of international neuro palliative care society he is trustee forum for indian neurology education and he is member of the steering committee of elicit end of life care in india task force and he is section editor of indian journal of palliative care so uh, we are very very fortunate today that both of them the best people uh, are here and i it, this is the best opportunity to learn uh, palliative care in uh, neuro degenerative disorders that how and palliative care what are the palliative care physicians responsibility what they should be doing and what they can approach a patient who is suffering with neuro degenerative disorders so thank you dr roop and thank you puneet for joining us thank you very much so puneet you can start thank you madam thank you ma'am for your kind words So Archana ji, I'll just share my screen. Yes, you can uh, share your screen. Uh, is it visible? Yes. Uh, thank you so much. So, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, uh, the topic for today will be prognostication and neuropalliative care. and i'm very very uh, thankful to dr roop sir for uh, moderating this session and he has provided me with the resource material and i also appreciate the indian neuro palliative care society uh, too so uh, to begin with uh, the topic is prognostication in neuro palliative care <clears throat> so why is it uh, very important ah so why is it very important as we know that uh, uh, as we know these days that palliative care is not only just limited to oncology setting but it is proven that it is very much useful in most of the non malignant diseases you name any disease cardiovascular neurological diabetes kidney liver everywhere and in neurology it has various scopes so what are some of the diseases which require palliative care to name it uh, we have alzheimer's care alzheimer diseases or other dementias where we know that as the disease progresses uh, people uh, the amount of uh, the or the severity of dementia increases and the role of palliative care increases here too similarly uh, motor neuron diseases such as uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis stroke multiple sclerosis patient progressive supranuclear palsy parkinsonism huntington's huntington disease and various other chronic neurological diseases they require palliative care so to begin with i will be talking about uh, the the brief introduction why do we require uh, palliative care in neurological diseases and uh, what are the symptom burden in few important uh, chron uh, chronological diseases and then uh, i'll be coming to the main topic that is prognostication in neuropalliative disease so to uh, so to to start with neuro palliative care is palliative care that focuses on the specific needs of patients with neurological neurological illnesses and their families the contribution of non communicable neurological disorders if we talk in terms of disability adjusted life years from all causes of india if you see in 1990 it was 4% and in 2019 it is almost double that is 8.2% so you can just imagine the disability adjusted life years and the role of palliative care in these patients neurological diseases including stroke uh, accounts for nearly 12% of all deaths worldwide 
and there is wide variation in terms of prevalence and prognosis. In amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, the prevalence is around 7 to 1 lakh, and the survival of these patients is only 2 to 3 years. And in Parkinsonism, the prevalence is uh, huge. That is 180 to uh, nearly 2,000 per 1 lakh, and the mean survival is 14 years. And in dementia, the prevalence is 700. In fact, uh, as, the, as the age progresses, the prevalence of dementia too increases. And the survival here is generally seen, it's 8 to 10 years. So now the question arises, why do we need neuropalliative care? Uh, the, uh, the past two decades have seen substantial progress in our abilities to understand, treat, and manage neurological diseases. We have seen uh, due to the advent of uh, disease-modifying therapies, deep brain uh, stimulation surgeries, as we know in Parkinsonism. And then uh, there is a lot of prevention efforts that have been uh, seen in stroke patients. And uh, there are various novel genetic approaches. They have all revolutionized uh, the uh, disease concept. But with this revolution also, despite this progress also, most neurological disease still remain incurable. Neurological disorders have all the characteristic and, uh, and are consistent with palliative care as per definition. So what is the definition of palliative care? It is an approach that improves the quality of life of patients and their families facing, life, uh, facing the problem associated with life-threatening illnesses through the prevention and relief of suffering by means of early identification and impeccable assessment and treatment of not only physical, but all other problems such as physical, psychosocial, and spiritual. And in neuropalliative care also, the uh, primary outcome is to uh, uh, give a best quality of life to these uh, patients as well as their uh, family members. So we should all take care of the symptom burden as well as their no, uh, psychosocial aspect also. So if we talk about the symptom burden of neurological disorders, if we classify uh, in terms of total pain concept, which is given by Dam Sisley uh, Saunders, uh, you will uh, be seeing that in physical component in these neurological disorder, there might be pain and physical discomfort. The patient might suffer insomnia. Fatigue is a very important concept. Constipation and bladder dysfunction is seen. Dementia is seen. Loss of motor skills and mobility. In fact, the functional status has decreased. In emotionally, you can see that there is anxiety depression, grief for present and future losses, anger, frustration, agitation. In spiritual, well, yes, uh, just imagine a person who was uh, independent and suddenly this thing happened in acute, suppose acute stroke is there. Or uh, in chronic diseases, uh, what happens, uh, uh, a lot of question arises in his mind. What is the meaning of life? Uh, what is the meaning of his uh, identity? Uh, is there any prognostic uncertainty or also there may be diminished or challenges to one's faith. So these can be termed in spiritual. In social, there may be uh, social stigma, isolation, loneliness, change in roles or relationships, concern for burdening others, assuming decision-making responsibilities for loved ones. And the most important is practical here, which has been included. That is, there might be financial concern uh, <clears throat> as the disease will be progressing. Suppose in Parkinsonism uh, diseases, you know that uh, uh, in Alzheimer's and Parkinsonism, we know that uh, the survival is uh, huge, uh, around uh, 10 to 15 years. So financial uh, constraint, financial uh, burden is also uh, very much there. So it is not just the patient. We should also take uh, into account the, the issues of the caregivers. So in this figure, you can see that uh, right after the disease, it is not just a straight trajectory or the declining trajectory. It has fluctuations. Uh, you see that as the disease progresses, there is fatigue, there is other symptoms. Then uh, finally, in the, especially in neurological disease, there is loss of mobility. And you can also term it as loss of uh, independence. And finally, uh, as the disease progresses, there might be death and bereavement. So here we can see that in uh, various diseases, uh, I'll just name a few, such as amyotropic lateral sclerosis, Parkinsonism, dementia, stroke patient, there are various symptoms which come to this patient. For example, in ALS, there, uh, there is a huge burden of pain, cellorrhea, spasticity, pseudobulbar effect, dysphagia, weight loss, respiratory insufficiency, especially if 
the bulbar involvement is there. In stroke patient, you know that there might be pain, dysphagia, and very important uh, issue that the patient plays are with their bladder and uh, bowel. Post-stroke uh, post seizures might be there and various psychological and spiritual issues because the outcome of stroke patient, it's uh, not that good. And in multiple sclerosis, spasticity, pain, spasm, gait disorder, bladder dysfunction, and in dementia, you can see that uh, there is uh, trouble remembering your information in early stages. And in late stages, these uh, really get uh, increased. And finally, there is a disorientation, confusing and behavior, and there is a difficulty in speaking and uh, swallowing. So these were the spectrum of uh, diseases and the symptoms. So palliative care need is very, very important. And where can this palliative uh, uh, come into a picture? You can have a clear and compassion, compassionate communication. You can provide a good symptom uh, relief. You can provide a good psychosocial support. You can provide a good spiritual well-being. Uh, you, you should always support the family members because I have not seen any other uh, specialty where we give time to the caregivers, we listen to their concerns and manage their suffering also. A good uh, care planning has to be there. A good end-of-life care has to be there. And there should be a good support for healthcare and professionals. So integration is the key. So if you talk about the models of integration, uh, we can uh, see here that there are a few models uh, which were proposed. The, transi uh, the traditional model, which uh, uh, you can see in the first figure, that is a transitional model of late involvement of specialist palliative care. When all the neurological symptoms uh, uh, management has been exhausted, and when it is just the terminal event, then they hand it over to palliative care physician for end of life. But as time passed by, they, uh, they said, no, it should start right from the diagnosis. So the second figure you can see of early and progressive involvement of specialist palliative care. In fact, now a more uh, flexible uh, model has been, uh, has been coming up that is trigger-based. And specialist palliative care intervention, wherever these triggers come, and uh, you chip in and you provide the best uh, advice and support to these patients, not only till the time of death, but also it, it extends to the time of bereavement. So uh, coming to the uh, point, very important point that when should we initiate specialist palliative care? Well, uh, we know that ideally it should, time, uh, it should start right at the time of diagnosis, but uh, we know that it is very hard. And, and these days, uh, uh, due to the limit, uh, 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 scarce or you can say limited uh, number of palliative physicians, it is very hard to start right from the time of diagnosis. So what are the general criteria and other criteria which uh, should be met? So general criteria are when the patient or the family raise concerns directly regarding the prognosis is limited and which hampers the pa patient's quality of life. And uh, when the patient or family make requests for hassendence, and there is appropriateness of uh, care, family's own quality of life. So these are the general, when the family members, they ask themselves. Secondly, when there is the diagnosis of a serious neurological illness, at the time of diagnosis, diagnosis of additional comorbidities are coming up and there is change in diagnosis. That <coughs> diagnosis. Third is medical event. This is very, very important criteria. Any hospitalization in a patient with neurological illness would you be surprised if the patient died during this hospitalization? This might be a surprise question you put forward to your physician. In the uh, ICU, if it is more than three days, hospitalized uh, patient, if there is more than seven days, we should generally uh, uh, talk uh, uh, about this surprise question to the treating physician. And if there are more than uh, two hospitalization within one year due to complication of any neurological illnesses, such as UTI, uh, repeated falls, aspiration, pneumonia, then and that is an indication. And there is actual or anticipated change in living situations. Third, uh, whenever we suspect that, yes, there is disease progression and increased dependence as indicated by loss of ability to work, change in mobility, change uh, or the need of assistance with activity of daily living, especially with your dressing, toileting, bathing, meals, the normal uh, processes which we follow in daily routine. If there is uh, any new behavioral uh, symptoms such as anger, social withdrawal, hallucination, so these are all suggestive of 
progression of the disease. So hence, uh, you should refer this patient or initiate specialist palliative care in these patients. Or uh, you can uh, have a time limited trial. That is, you should consider whether the predefined goals were met or not in that specific time which you sought. If not, you should always initiate a specialist palliative care. And lastly, whenever we feel that yes, the caregiver distress of burnout is uh, happening, then also you should always initiate specialist palliative care to provide not only the supportive management to the patient, but also a decent amount to the caregivers. So we have seen here that it is not just one aspect uh, why palliative care is important, but it is a paradigm. Right from the starting, that is breaking bad news to psychological and spiritual uh, support, the, a good uh, symptom management uh, uh, to uh, complex symptom, uh, symptom management. That is the role of ventilatory support, whether you should take DNI, DR decisions, whether PEG is important or not, and, uh, to the end of life care decisions, uh, continuing to the pre. So here you can see this and you should have some, one question is mine that what am I missing for all these what is really important that is you need to learn the art of prognostication and prognosis right so coming to the main topic of today that is prognostication and in neurology so what do you mean by prognosis prognosis is defined as the relative probabilities of various outcome of the natural history of any disease so why is it very important and what are the reasons to be proficient at prognosis to provide patient and their family members with information so that they can set their own goals, their priorities, right? And the expectation of care with the involvement, or you can say the autonomy of the patient. To help the patient develop insight into their dying, to uh, assist clinicians in their decision-making, to compare similar patients with regard to outcomes, which is very important. To establish patient's eligibility for uh, care programs, including timely referral to hospice uh, programs, especially when the prognosis is less than six months. For designing and analysis of clinical trials, for policy making with respect to appropriate resource utilization and allocation of support services. So, if uh, here, if we talk, uh, if we uh, uh, talk about the book of prognosis written by uh, Hippocrates, what did uh, he say? Uh, he says that uh, uh, that it is very important for physicians to cultivate uh, cultivate the uh, the importance of foreseeing and foretelling in the presence of the sick, the present, the past, and future, and explaining the omissions which patient have been guilty of. He will be more readily believed to be acquainted with the circumstances of the sick, so that men will have confidence of interest themselves to such a physician. So foreseeing and foretelling, it's very, very important in uh, prognostication. By foreseeing, we mean that formulate a plan and foretelling means that you communicate this plan effectively. So what are the steps involved in foreseeing? If you talk about the signs and signs, what are the points which should be kept in mind? It should start with a disease, what type of the disease it is. If we talk about the function, we should assess the change in performance status. And how do you uh, uh, check the changes in performance status? You have various uh, functionality uh, tools. For example, the palliative performance score, the ECOG, which is very much used in oncology, the KPS score, which is now used in various disease trajectory. So these can help us in uh, assessing the performance status. You know, uh, there are certain tests, uh, certain physical science and laboratory markers, for example, some tumor markers, creatinine, uh, low uh, albumin, LDH level, which shows that yes, uh, the prognosis uh, might be bad. And similarly, there are certain signs, for example, delirium, dyspnea, anorexia, weight loss, dysphagia, as we have, we all have used PPI index, right? So all these components are available there itself. And various tools uh, to utilize or uh, to tell about the survival. So various prognostic tools are uh, such as the PPI, which I had just uh, mentioned here, the PPS. Similarly, the uh, judgment, that is your clinical judgment. It is by far the most 
experience or you can say that the, as the physicians are experienced they are in a better state of mind to tell the exact uh, current status as well also to a certain extent predict in the future so these are the four things that is formulation of a clinical uh, prognostication and foretelling is an art that is how do you communicate so it should all be centered to the to uh, the family the patient whoever it's uh, there to uh, frame uh, the concepts the information properly and to uh, dispense it properly so that the patient can understand it well and finally you summarize so the important points they were center frame it with cautions and to follow up so this was the portal so if we talk in detail about the foreseeing and foretelling till the middle of the last century the three skills of physician that is diagnosis therapeutics and prognosis came into picture but Oh, what we have seen that diagnosis and therapeutics took the lead and prognosis stayed back, right? So patients do expect physicians to prognosticate in a fashion that is simultaneously and impossibly honest, accurate, and optimistic. So this you should always keep in mind. So um, uh, if you talk about uh, the prognostication uh, in estimating and uh, communicating the expected course of an individual uh, diseases, well, this framework is very important. That is, uh, you should uh, take the help of predictors, the outcomes and perspective. In predictors, you, you know that environmental uh, really plays a, a role, such as uh, what are the healthcare access? A, a post-stroke patient who has, uh, who should be now managed uh, with good physiotherapies, good diet and everything, well, a rich man can afford, but what about the poor patient? They can't, right? So environmental uh, predators really help. Similarly, the host factors, how is his functional status? What are his comorbidities? What is his disease factors? For example, what is the extent of the tumor? And then if you talk about the outcomes, mainly it is in terms of fatality and non-fatality, uh, such as remission, relapse, residual uh, deficient. But uh, it is very important to define outcome in terms of quality of life and independence. Whether the quality of life is good uh, for this existing uh, disease or not. So uh, these should uh, be taken care of. Similarly, in terms of perspective, what is the patient and family's uh, plan for the future? Uh, similarly, what does the physician want or recommend it? Recommend. Because if he knows that the uh, disease is uh, uh, it's very much aggressive and the patient has come with uh, some uh, crisis and he uh, and the patient might require ventilation. So it is important for the physician to, uh, to uh, offer the choice of treatment to the patient that uh, whether a mechanical ventilation is required for this patient or uh, he should be provided, uh, taken a DNI, DNR and provided the best supportive management in the uh, uh, in the room along with his family member so these key decisions need to be taken care of. and also similarly the this will also help the policy makers to make some uh, uh, resource decisions so if we talk about the prognostic outcomes mainly uh, you have seen the 5d model in oncological prognosis uh, such as the patient may ask you directly how much to uh, how much time do, uh, is there with me right so uh, he speaks in terms of death whether disease progression or recurrence is there, will the ascites accumulate further uh, in me or not, doctor? Will this ascites keep on coming uh, or pleural effusion keep on coming to me or not? Whether I'll be able to walk or not? So these are certain 5D uh, models. Uh, similarly, drug toxicity and the cause of this. But in neuroprognostication, we mainly rely on how long that is the potential survival impact and how well that is the cognitive and physical impairment should be uh, are um, uh, well within the normal limit or not. And in fact, whether the quality of life of these patients are maintained or not. Therefore, we need to maintain uh, uh, and formulate a prognosis. For formulating any prognosis, a, a literature analysis has to be done. So if we talk about the literature analysis, uh, well, uh, it starts from right from the case series, case control, cohort, then you know that it goes to randomized uh, control trials. But uh, it is very unfortunate that if you see about the various literature, you will be finding more of uh, 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 the diagnosis and treatment, but the, the research in prognosis lags a lot. 
so it is uh, our duty that uh, we should have more of these literatures and we should rely on randomized control uh, trials uh, rather than just casery cohort in terms of prognosis too second in formulating prognosis is to know how what is the age and life expectancy uh, using the life tables uh, for example in this figure you can see that uh, here we uh, we can see that yes parkinsonism affects all the age groups uh, we can see but suppose a patient has been diagnosed diagnosed at the age of 40 he still has 20 to 30 years left right if he's diagnosed at 60 he still has 10 years left right so the age remaining life expectancy has to be taken care of and then you will be able to provide the next further best supportive care to these patients and in uh, and in this uh, what uh, uh, what factor comes into place that is homeostenosis that is the decline of physiological reserve with age we all know that as the age increases your certain parameters your ability to your immunity and other ability uh, decreases so this is uh, homeostenosis so how can this be uh, uh, assessed this can be assessed by functional status whether the uh, patient was uh, a moribund state or not so how can you uh, assess the functional status you can assess by looking at his activities of daily living well the basic uh, activities such as the bathing can be seen whether the patient dresses eats toileting and transferring is uh, there or not these are the basic but if you talk about the instrumental which depends on cognition whether he can use the telephone whether transportation can be done whether he can take his medications or not whether he can maintain his uh, finances or not so activities of daily living has to be uh, has to be uh, seen uh, while formulating a prognosis if the active uh, with, uh, if the person is able to do all these we know that yes the um, the, the functionality status is good but if all these or a certain level has been decreased, then we might uh, tell that, yes, the disease has progressed to that extent that he is not being able to do these activities. Similarly, the frailty has to be checked. And if we talk about frailty, what is it? It is aging related syndrome of physiological decline with marked vulnerability to adverse health outcomes. So if we talk about this frailty, uh, frailty uh, score, it has five uh, points. Uh, we may, uh, each uh, given one point each. And then uh, what are the uh, questions used? They are the fatigue. They are uh, resistance. Resistance in turn, we, we can ask him that, uh, is he facing any difficulty walking one uh, flight of stairs or not? Uh, and in ambulation, uh, do you have any difficulty in walking 200 to 300 meters or not? And whether you have uh, illnesses, that is comor comor comorbid illness, and uh, whether there is greater than 5% loss of weight in the past one year. If the frail score is greater than three points, then we say that, yes, it is frailty. So as the age progresses and, um, uh, and frailty is equally important uh, in geriatric population. And the next point while formulating any prognosis in this patient is comorbidity burden. We, we should see that what is his comorbidity. Uh, similarly, there's a, a Walter index that is a bedside risk scoring system and prediction of one year mortality in older adults that is greater than 70 years admitted to hospital for any acute illnesses. Uh, well, the risk factors uh, here which they uh, have was uh, the male sex, and then uh, they had one to four activity of daily living. Uh, uh, if uh, that was uh, uh, there, so they were given a point of two. If all uh, ADL dependent, if they were all ADL dependent, so they were given a, a point of five. And similarly, there were other uh, markers such as the creatinine. If it is greater than three, they gave the points uh, two. Albumin, if it was less than three, they gave a point of two. And if there was CHF two, and uh, similarly, if there was cancer, they were uh, solitary three, and if it is metastatic, they had given eight. So if you calculate all, if uh, you had uh, seen that if the cumulative point was zero to one, the one year risk uh, was just around four, four percent, which was, you can say it is uh, close to the general population. But if the point was greater than uh, six, you can see that the one year risk was nearly 64%. So this is very, very important, especially in cancer patients where metastatic cancer are there, you know that yes, the one year survival uh, rate, uh, it's uh, very high. So Walter index also can be used. 
and a very important point whenever we formulate prognosis is disease trajectory. Disease trajectory can also be used uh, to uh, explain the patient in a pen and paper that how and uh, what disease tra trajectory will the uh, uh, disease be. So if we talk about the trajectories of diseases in uh, neurological diseases, uh, broadly it has been defi defined in uh, four uh, figures here. You can see the first uh, upper left, you can see that this is a short period of decline. Well, this is mainly, mainly seen in oncological settings, right? But in terms, if you talk about neurology, you, you can see this uh, in uh, ALS and GBM and various spine neurological diseases. Second, uh, it's entry, re-entry. Here you can see that there is uh, an acute decrease in uh, progression, uh, progression, but you, you can always appreciate that there are certain spikes that and these spikes show that uh, uh, these are the trigger points or the uh, points where they, uh, they refer uh, to the uh, neurologist or the hospital. So we should uh, be able to identify these spikes and to explain the patients that when these spikes come, uh, and uh, the disease is progressed, uh, the death can uh, occur at any of these spikes as well. So this, uh, the trigger points has to be explained. Similarly, uh, one is prolonged dwindling. Uh, here you can see that as the age and frailty is there, there is continuous decrease and progression of the disease. But the point to remember is that the time to death is uh, high. Uh, well, uh, these patients are of Alzheimer and Parkinsonism where the survival is generally seen more than five to 10 years. Uh, and in a sudden neurological impairment, especially in acute stroke or HIE, many um, um, uh, or any uh, acute uh, disease, you can see that acute event is there and there is a decrease in the functionality. The functionality decreases. And when over the time of a certain time with the pro pro provision of critical uh, care, there is slight uh, uh, illness recovery and further the progression of disease is there. So while explaining all these, uh, 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 all this, all the prognosis to the patient, it is always important that we have a pen and paper and we describe uh, the trajectory uh, in terms of these figures so that it is very much easy for the patients and uh, sorry for the caregivers to understand and um, uh, to make uh, uh, certain uh, goals of care decision uh, easily. Uh, whether the DNI DNR status has to be done or not, whether the PEG is important in PSP patient or not, so these de decisions can be taken appropriately if we uh, if we know the trajectories uh, ourselves and we can explain these trajectories to the uh, caregivers. So it is very important to identify the terminal illnesses too in palliative care. In onco palliative care, yes, we know uh, because uh, based on the tumor biology, uh, it is very easy for us to. Uh, explain the patient. But in a neuropalliative care, the four trigger point, that is the decisional, it's very important. In acute situation, the major concern uh, of self-fulfilling prophecies come into picture, whether in acute situation, when we know that if the prognosis is not that good, we should put the patient in ventilator or not. Is it justified or not? In chronic situation, the issue of ensuring palliative care needs are met. So this is all decisional. So the clinical uh, skills come into picture. And if we talk about terminal illness, what is it? Terminal illness is the one from which recovery cannot be expected with the available treatment and death is considered to be unavoidable in the foreseeable future. And in or in uh, uh, if we talk about another definition, it says that an incurable and irreversible condition caused by an injury, disease, or illness that would cause uh, death within a reasonable period of time in accordance with accepted medical standards and where the application of life-sustaining treatment would serve only to prolong the process of time. And finally, it is very important when, when we know that uh, what is the literature analysis, when we know that what is the survival age and, uh, uh, age and life expectancy, when we know what is the functionality status, when we know about the comorbidity burden, and when we know about the disease trajectory, it is the duty of the physician to integrate all these and to communicate it properly. So, so physical integration, it comprises of anticipate, anchor, tailoring, and uh, if there is any uh, bias, so you need to de-bias. So if you talk about anticipate, 
what information will the patient and family want how long will i live how will i live in terms of how long will i live uh, uh, it is always good to share ranges the mean ranges rather than just one specific time you can talk in terms of hours to day and days in uh, acute uh, conditions days to weeks weeks to months and how well it is always good to give uh, them the best uh, scenarios the worst scenarios and in that patient the most likely scenario which i'll be taking in an example and a good symptom care so in if you talk about the anchoring an anchor how can you anchor using the survival data using the typical disease trajectory as i was telling you and assess the prognostic awareness and if you talk about the problem of anchoring and uh, the survival data it is very important uh, to know what is the prognosis so if if i talk uh, about few important uh, prognosis in certain diseases in als you can see that the median survival is around 1 to 4 years but in 10 to 20% it's nearly greater than 10 years if there is an onset of bulb or respiratory symptom the survival is less in other cases it may increase so we should know about the specific markers to not just a broader uh, prognostication to all the als patients similarly in glioblastoma the median is uh, uh, 12 to 15 months all will depend upon the immunohistochemistry and surgical resection if surgical resection has been done and if addition has been provided the survival can be uh, increased and uh, and in greater than 10% you have seen survival over 5 years as well in brain metastasis uh, similarly the median uh, 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 survival duration is 7 months in alzheimer diseases the median survival as i was talking is 3 to 8 years in idiopathic parkinsonism the life uh, expectancy is around 10 to 20 years it will again uh, depend on specific markers such as the age of onset and dementia and in uh, progressive supranuclear palsy and multiple systemic uh, atrophy uh, the uh, median survival is nearly 6 to uh, 10 years but specific markers suppose if the patient has dysphagia and generalized autonomic uh, failure the survival decreases so whenever we talk about prognosis it is it is not about just a blanket but you should know about the individual uh, symptoms or the specific markers what the patient is having so that you can prognosticate it accordingly and in uh, this uh, the uh, this one chronic situation and in acute uh, situation i won't go in detail uh, but you can see that in uh, hemispheric ischemic stroke the mean survival is just 14 days to 6 months and in uh, cerebral ischemic stroke it's 3 months in pontine hemorrhage it is 3 to 12 months in cerebral hemorrhage is 3 months so we should have a fair idea about the predictive outcome what are the prognosis and the the, the third part uh, about uh, it is a tailor that is it should all be uh, individualized as i was talking uh, based on his sign and symptoms based on his comorbidities consider mean uh, survival estimates always uh, talk in terms of ranges consider patient specific factors because these can uh, make the prognosis better or worse as i had already explained using an example that if the patient is economically sound and if he can afford better uh, treatment the uh, uh, the prognosis in neurological setting increases because if a good physiotherapy diet referral and all the uh, other uh, uh, care plan has been taken or uh, taken care you can see that there is a good uh, recovery in stroke patients compared uh, to those patients who 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 are not able to make use of these resources and also uh, the tools available so, uh, as i uh, mentioned about the ppi pps so we should also uh, be using these uh, uh, tools and then uh, explaining the prognosis and a very important part is when the patient feels that uh, that there is some uh, bias or he is not being able to understand the, uh, the prognosis himself it is the right time for him to have a time out that is the prognostic time out you check your own biases was rather than giving some uh, false uh, prognosis it is always uh, um, good to review some literatures see uh, uh, get some second opinion see some uh, details so that uh, you'll be in a better and confident uh, state while uh, delivering the prognosis so if we talk that if, if a too narrow um, uh, too na uh, if you see that if there is a too narrow of a prognostic estimate then uh, you can uh, feel that uh, the physician is overly confident and if there is too much uncertainty Uh, the patient might have limited experience in such uh, clinical conditions. So 
so that is why these uh, uh, review literatures clinical details are very much important and uh, these biases can be checked and uh, after all these things are done now is the time to uh, tell your patient or communicate or foretell these uh, prognosis right so elements of prognostic discussion are who that uh, are you whom are you telling is it the patient or the surrogates or the patient with the surrogates so uh, whenever uh, you are talking to them all the decision uh, should be uh, all sorry not a decision all the questions should be addressed uh, questions in terms of the uh, goals of care plan uh, what is the survival and how will be the tra tra trajectory and what all uh, uh, information uh, uh, questions about the withholding uh, questions also need to be taken care of. But uh, when there are multiple providers, we should ensure that there is consistent and consensual opinions given to each and everyone, so that there, uh, there should not be any contradictory information. And uh, uh, what to be given, and that is how long and uh, how well. So if you talk about how long, uh, this, is, uh, this can be explained using an uh, example, how long. 70-year-old female diagnosed with ALS six months back, now developing dysarthria, discussing option of gastrostomy and ventilation. The rough estimate is uh, generally we have uh, seen that it is less than one year, but the caveat here is impossible to predict with a certainty, but I'm worried the time may be shorter. It could also be uh, longer if we hope uh, if PEG uh, can be given. So what this uh, patient underwent, uh, the patient underwent PEG, later started NIV, only NIV, uh, they were counseled enough that mechanical ventilation shouldn't be there and the patient passed away at eight months uh, at home peacefully. How well, if you look about this example, 70 year old female hypertensive right basal ganglionic intracerebral hematoma discussing decompressive craniotomy. Well, uh, you should give out uh, the best case scenario, the worst case scenario, and most likely the worst case scenario will have multiple medical complications and may never leave the hospital. The most likely scenario or the guess which is given by the physician will be better than and feeding tube and catheter, but will recognize and respond to family. And the best case will be, will be able to speak by mouth, may walk with support. But what happened to this patient underwent craniotomy is a life for five years, but is uh, dependent in, for all the ADL activities, except it. So we should know that, uh, in especially uh, looking at this example, we should know that if the patient is so much dependent on um, everything for these five years, is this justified for uh, uh, going uh, with these type of craniotomies or uh, rather than choosing other uh, supportive management? These are the questions. And uh, the question will, uh, uh, next question arises, when, when do we prognosticate? Well, there is no timeline. It should be as early as uh, possible, but it should be given bit by bit, not in one go, so that they are able to digest. So uh, if you talk about the prognostic awareness, uh, may, this is mainly seen in a neuro-oncology patient. What do you understand about your illness? How serious do you believe things are? What have you been told? Do you have a sense of how much time might be left for you? Well, if you uh, uh, take help of these examples, you'll be know you'll be knowing about the awareness. If there is no awareness, the patient might tell uh, that if I follow the protocols and keep a good state of mind, I think I have a good chance of beating this. Just imagine a neuro uh, oncology uh, patient telling this. And if the patient has limited awareness, uh, he might tell, I don't believe this is curable. Ninety-five percent lethal, but uh, five percent survival rate is still there. I need, a, I need to have a good luck or they can see that if God is there, uh, I need you know. And if there is a full awareness, that is, it's an aggressive tumor, they have never said it's not going to come back. It's awful for cancer, it's worse uh, of the worst. Probably by the end of uh, October or maybe uh, worrying that I have just uh, two to three years, maximum two years probably. So this is full awareness of your disease. So how will this awareness come? This awareness can always come if you sit with the patient and communicate the prognosis effectively. The role of communication is the most important while delivering uh, uh, information about prognosis. And uh, how do you deliver uh, the prognosis and how do you deliver the uh, communication uh, uh, while uh, 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 while we have these mnemonics such as uh, the spikes protocol. 
where we break bad news. Here you can see in setting, there is uh, you provide a good environment, minimize distraction, sit down uh, for the interview. Perception, see what do you know so far. Invitation, uh, uh, invitation you give a small, uh, you ask them what do you want to know. Break it down a little uh, by little in a time. Knowledge, uh, see how much they know and impart knowledge. Be direct, use plain language. Do not use harsh language. And while giving all this information, always uh, uh, be uh, 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 make sure that all their emotions are also addressed. That is why uh, it should be uh, in an empathetic way. And finally, you summarize. And uh, for uh, responding to emotions, it is always good um, uh, to use this nurse uh, mnemonics. Uh, here you can see that nurse stands for naming, understanding, respect, support, and explore. In naming, this news must be very overwhelming. You can use this, uh, these sentences. Understand, I can't imagine how hard it is here, this news. Respect, you all have done a wonderful job of researching this illness and asking questions. Support, we will be here to support you and your wife step by step. And explore, tell me more about what is worrying you. And uh, after you have communicated properly, it is also a duty to have a advanced care plan. As the patient can have declining cognitive and functional status, it is, it is important to set the advanced care guidelines. Proper instruction should be made and how to go forward in case of any future life-threatening event. And uh, the role of survey decision marker, it's very important in logical decisions, especially if uh, the patient uh, in the later uh, part of his uh, journey his unconscious or his uh, consciousness state is not good. So surrogate uh, decision uh, can be taken by those family members or those uh, persons who have been identified. And finally, end of life care and uh, for, uh, future hospice admission should also be discussed as their trajectory is uh, progressing. Uh, to, uh, 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 this is my uh, last slide. It is not just the uh, patient and in neurological, especially it is the caregivers who need the maximum support support the domains uh, which should be taken care of are the health the financial household informational social support has to be provided not only that the mental picture or the psychological uh, uh, turmoil which they are go uh, going on while facing this uh, pro um, uh, while facing this uh, disease because they are also facing this disease it is not just the uh, patient so these uh, their uh, uh, health should also be taken care of so finally, I conclude uh, telling that the prognosis in neurology is very complex, formulate a care plan, and finally executed by good communication. And for formulate, it is very important to foresee, that is formulate a prognosis using all the parameters which I told, right from the time of diagnosis, what is the host factors, uh, host factors uh, using all the uh, tools available, and then communicating it properly. And then identifying the patient's need as early as possible and plan a comprehensive care plan for the patient and caregiver so that their quality of life is maintained. So I end my slide by telling that the power of healing does not lie in just prescribing drugs and medical treatment. What it essentially requires is caring for the patients. So uh, uh, I would just uh, like Dr. Roop, sir, uh, to please pitch in. And uh, uh, if I have missed out anything, to please now uh, thank you puneet that was very detailed and uh, it uh, really shows how well you've uh, mastered the topic and it is uh, not a very easy topic especially for uh, 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 people who come from uh, uh, the onco palliative background but as i think we all are beginning to understand Neuropalliative care is going to be uh, more and more important for anybody practicing palliative care. Uh, in fact, I would put it this way that if you can handle uh, neuropalliative, then the rest of non oncology palliative is not that complicated. So uh, let's take questions and uh, any comments. Rup, I agree with you. This is an outstanding presentation. Thank you. I, uh, Puneet has really done a marvelous job.
thank you so much sir. as i really thank uh, dr group sir for giving his resource material which were very easy and that is why this made uh, the presentation easy for me to deliver any questions please post Um, let me see the rank. Okay. Uh, prognostication in related page. The ED. Great. Would you? So I I think of what uh, Doctor Nitu means is somebody who lands up in the casualty uh, gets. intubated and ventilated in that acute situation and then you have to kind of go back and speak to the family uh, it's something that uh, we need to understand that in general hospitals if there is a palliative care unit and there is uh, there is like in hinduja uh, you do get called uh, then you need to understand how you're going to handle this punit would you like to take that on Okay, Doctor Nitu is saying in advanced malignancies, but I'm sure uh, there's more to it than that. Yes. Uh, well, in advanced uh, malignancy, uh, if the patient lands up, it is first and important that uh, he must have visited us before, and uh, if he must have visited us before, it was our duty to prognosticate them right from the start. And once prognostication had been done properly. Uh, so uh, the patient will understand that uh, now in the, uh, he has come to the emergency but we will be only going ahead with just supportive management to a certain extent till the nip we will not be going up with the mechanical intubation if the prognosis is not not that good so you should uh, you should uh, uh, you should uh, be able to provide the best supportive care to that patient and in second scenario if the patient has just come to you right up front and he has uh, he doesn't know about the pro uh, prognosis of the patient and he has just come in emergency it is your duty again to give him all uh, a cafeteria approach like situation that you should tell him about the trajectory as i mentioned tell him about the survival tell him about the prognosis tell him about everything and let him accept what he wants if uh, he understand the prognosis he will be again going with your decision and uh, sometimes because in this acute situation it is very hard to explain prognosis sometimes the patient will uh, uh, despite knowing everything they will um, they might go for mecha mechanical ventilation and invasive therapy but yes if your prognosis is good 90% of the times they will listen to you and they will opt for best uh, supportive uh, care yeah so that so in uh, one thing to understand is that uh, when you're dealing with an oncological situation um, you know uh, this this discussion opens up ethical issues as well when it is oncology uh, it's a tumor that makes all the ethical decisions uh, the problem is that outside oncology you uh, as the clinician together with the other clinicians around you and the family uh, typically have to do all this uh, heavy lifting of figuring out what is right what is uh, what is appropriate and so on so which is where communication becomes really important so if you look at some examples one is the example say of somebody who's had a stroke and develops aspiration and comes up and gets intubated and ventilated yeah you know that this is probably a patient who is going to follow the entry reentry trajectory and you could explain that to the family and uh, you can tell them that you offer them a time limited trial of uh, intensive care and then they may well come back to whatever level of functioning they want uh, they have uh, and on the other hand you have somebody who has motor neuron disease who where the discussion with the provider has not been complete and they come into casualty and they end up getting intubated ventilated uh, here it becomes a more a challenging discussion because it really depends on what uh, prognostic awareness uh, has stage has been reached and uh, again 
uh, once channels of communication are opened uh, in this situation too if you are able to communicate i mean you could well have a patient who goes through the motions of getting a tracheostomy and invasive ventilation is set up at home and so on but they they are now aware of what is coming and uh, your your conversation with them can then continue you you have that time to do all of that so in in uh, it, it really depends on finally it depends on prognosis and that is why the importance of uh, prognosticating outside oncology in oncology once you reach uh, the stage that the patient is bedridden you know that the survival is about 3 to 4 months in non oncology the patient could be bedridden for years and that's why uh, how long how well uh, what the family wants what the family can manage all those come into your your matrix of discussion Else. Any other questions on chat? There was a comment also. I think I saw. Yep. So okay. So uh, Dr. Punita Varthi asked about handy MD calc. Um, unfortunately, no. You really have to. Uh, 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 how how would i put this you have to be reasonably aware of uh, what the illness trajectory is like you have to develop a partnership with neurologists locally and uh, get a sense of what they feel about the prognosis before you communicate it's 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 uh, it, it's i i think that working on the partnership if you are handling neuropalliative care is quite important uh as you know uh, i and others have been working on getting this partnership going but i will be a little blunt i personally feel that uh, the motivation and the uh, how to put it the greed for knowledge about neurology is much higher amongst palliative care providers so i think i would if there is a message it is that i feel that all of you need to get involved in learning this and building these partnerships and let the neurologists join join as as and when they do we are close to the last 2 to 3 minutes uh, Dr. Uh, Sima, would you like to add? Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, Rupa, there Sima. is another question in the chat. Oh yeah, yeah. Let me let me look. Trial of extubation and MND is it ethical? Of course. I mean, uh, uh, in the sense that you will, this is going to be a palliative extubation. Uh, I presume, but this depends on how well uh, the uh, everything has been communicated. remember that in uh, uh, mnd uh, except in very late stages where the patient is completely paralyzed including eye movements um and that happens after years in the initial period of time the patient can communicate the patient is awake alert and it is possible to communicate not easy but possible uh, i have had patients where they been intubated ventilated but they are still using their fingers to whatsapp I have had patients who uh, use eye movements uh, to pick out letters on a whiteboard. Uh, eye movements with a laser pointer connected to a frame of a, a spectacle to uh, pick out letters and and answer questions. So uh, it it's important. So obviously, uh, when you go down that route, there will be uh, you have to handle collusion. You have to handle the family, and then communicate with the patient. At the end of it, the patient says. invasive ventilation is burdensome to me um it's very very clear from the uh, 2018 supreme court judgment that you cannot force ventilation on a patient who does not want it yeah 
Is that the last? Yes. So, so Roop, uh, what I, I think uh, the message that's going very clear is this, that particularly for neuropalliative care, it has to be a partnership uh, because of the fact that you must have very deep domain knowledge uh, about things. Now, uh, it, it may be nice to, you know, the common conditions, uh, it may be very general, but then as one of the slides Puni said, that uh, for each individual, it could be totally different. Uh, so I think the ideal combination would be that the neurologist and the palliative care physician works together. And that's the only way that that can happen. Of course, uh, another very good thing is for a neurologist to become a palliative care physician, like my dear friend Rup Gursani is. And uh, probably some of the ne senior neuro uh, neurologists could take up that. But uh, overall, it's been extremely informative, this lecture. And excellent job, Doctor. Thank you. Puneet. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Please take a book. Well thank done. you so much. Yes, absolutely Puneet. well. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Dr. Roop, for your uh, excellent presentation today. Uh, I'd like to share that this presentation will be the last for this current series. We will have a break next Monday. There will be no, no session. Um, the new series is going to be, has been renamed as the Academy of Palliative Medicine's Online Lecture Series 1. And it will begin from the 17th of July, same 6.30 a.m. And uh, we will present 37 lectures in that series. So um, enjoy your one week break and we'll reconvene on the 17th of July. Thank you, everyone. Bye, thanks. Thank you.